Hey everyone, good morning. This will be the last video in the rotational dynamics chapter. So let's do a problem that covers the topic of rolling with slipping. It starts off by talking about the difference in strength between rolling friction and kinetic friction when an object rolls without slipping. For example, if we take a coin and we apply a force to make it roll without slipping, it can travel pretty far. But if we apply that same force with the coin lying face down, the distance that it slides along is much smaller. The problem states this quantitatively by saying that whenever we have rolling without slipping, the kinetic friction acting on the object is approximately zero. This means that the linear and angular accelerations are also approximately zero, and the center of mass velocity and angular speed will be constant. And we're given two equations down at the bottom showing how these quantities are related to one another. That covers the case of rolling without slipping. Rolling with slipping is a little bit different. In that situation, the kinetic friction is not approximately zero, and it will act on the object until rolling without slipping is established. The problem wants us to apply these ideas to a generic solid cylinder that rolls along a horizontal surface. Imagine something like this. Here's our cylinder over on the left with mass m and radius r, and we're going to spin it up to some initial angular speed of omega naught, and it will roll along and move to the right. There's going to be some initial distance where the cylinder rolls with slipping, and the kinetic friction is non-zero. And then the rest is rolling without slipping, where the kinetic friction shrinks accordingly. Now that we have an idea of what's going on here, let's take a look at part A. We need to draw a free body diagram of this cylinder and use that to get the linear and angular accelerations relative to the center of mass. Let's start our diagram by setting up a coordinate system that's centered on the middle of the cylinder. The forces acting on that cylinder during rolling with slipping will be its weight, the normal force, and kinetic friction. The kinetic friction points to the right for two reasons. One reason is that we need a force responsible for the center of mass acceleration to the right. The other reason is that we need a force responsible for the torque causing a negative angular acceleration. If we point the friction to the right, then we satisfy both of those requirements. And that's it for the free body diagram. I'm going to move everything over to the side and ignore the rotational stuff for now, so we can focus on the sum of forces. Let's replace the kinetic frictional force with its definition, and then hop over to the sum of forces in the y direction to get the value of n. Our cylinder doesn't accelerate vertically while moving, so we get the normal force minus the weight being equal to zero, and thus these two forces are equal to each other. Let's go back to our equation from the x direction. I'll switch out the normal force for the weight and then plug in its definition. We get the mass of the cylinder on both sides, which can be canceled out. And mu sub k times g is the linear acceleration that we're looking for. Let's do the rotational part next. Since the normal force goes through the axis of rotation, it won't have an associated torque. It's the same story for the weight. The kinetic friction, however, does not act through the center. It's acting at the spot where the cylinder and the surface interact, at a perpendicular distance equal to the radius of the cylinder. So now we're ready for the sum of torques equation. This sum is just a single torque. And since it's acting opposite to the initial positive rotation, we include a negative sign. Let's cancel out a factor of r 
and then plug in our previous definition for the kinetic friction. We get the mass on both sides again, so let's get rid of that and then simplify. If we multiply both sides by 2 and then divide both sides by the radius, we get a negative angular acceleration that matches our free body diagram. And part A is now done. In part B, we're going to figure out the distance that the cylinder moves through as it rolls with slipping. Here's our picture again. The problem description says that the moment we set this cylinder down onto the surface, it's rotating at a rate of omega naught and there is no initial center of mass velocity. Once we start the timer, that center of mass velocity will begin to increase and the angular speed will begin to decrease. And once we reach these values, that's when rolling without slipping kicks in. So we're going to use this information to solve for that distance in red. And to get it, we'll need to figure out the amount of time in this interval. So let's start with this kinematic equation. Since our cylinder doesn't start with a center of mass velocity, we can get rid of V-naught right away. And speaking of center of mass velocity, we know that it will have this value the moment that rolling without slipping begins. So let's plug that in over on the left-hand side. Now, unfortunately, we don't know the value of omega z. We were only given omega naught. But that's okay, because we can relate those two quantities by using the kinematic equation for angular speed. Once we plug that in, we have everything that we need in order to solve for the time. I'll start the process by distributing r into the parentheses and then slide the second term on the left over to the other side. If we factor out the time and then divide both sides by the difference inside the parentheses, our next step is to use the equations for the linear and angular accelerations from part A. The r's in the denominator will cancel out and the same goes for the negative signs as well. This gives us two positive terms downstairs that can be added together. And the result is our rolling with slipping time that we needed. Let's take this time and head over to the kinematic equation for distance. The first two terms in that equation can be eliminated. So let's clean this up and then plug in our expressions for the linear acceleration and time. Let's distribute the square and then cancel out a common factor of mu sub k times g. After simplifying, the 2 and the 9 in the denominator can be combined to give us 18. And part b is now done. There's one last thing for us to do here. We need to calculate the net amount of work that's done by the friction over the distance we just solved for. Let's figure that out the easy way by using energy conservation. There's no change of height involved as this cylinder moves, so we're free to trash those potential energy terms right off the bat. Let's clean this up and then split the kinetic energy terms on both sides into translational and rotational parts. The translational piece on the initial side can also be thrown in the garbage since there's no initial center of mass velocity. So we end up with two terms on both sides and to get the work term isolated on the left we need to move the initial rotational piece over to the right hand side. Now we can plug in some definitions. The moment of inertia for a cylinder is one half mr squared. So let's make that substitution next. The one-halves in the rotational terms will combine to make one-fourth. And we get a quantity in the second term that we've actually seen before. One of our previous reminders said that the center of mass velocity, once rolling without slipping begins, is equal to r omega z. Our first two terms can now be added together.
And if we use another kinematic equation, we can relate the center of mass velocity to the known linear acceleration. Once we plug that in, we can eliminate the initial center of mass velocity term, since we know that's equal to zero. Let's go ahead and substitute our previous expressions for the linear acceleration and the time. I'm also going to cancel out that mu sub k times g before squaring. Once we clean things up and take care of that, there's some simplification needed in the first term. We have another situation where these two terms can be added together, but we need a common denominator first. Let's multiply the second term by a special factor of 1, which will result in the following. 1 over 12 minus 3 over 12 is equal to negative 2 over 12, which we can simplify one last time to negative 1 over 6. And now we're all done. At this point, we've covered everything that this chapter has to offer, and we're ready to move on to the new topics of equilibrium and elasticity. I'd like to thank you all for watching, and I hope to see you there.